So COVID-19 is an underdiagnosed uh, condition in children, especially those who are in housing distress. The two types of housing distress I would like to talk about today are homeless children in the US and those who are seeking refugee or asylum or immigrating um, and arriving at the US-Mexico border. Um, the lack of identification, lack of testing, lack of treatment, and lack of suitable recovery options exist for children in general, but especially for those who are in housing distress. And I think that these factors together represent our nation's lack of commitment to children's human rights as defined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. I propose that implementation of a human children's rights policy agenda would improve the well-being of these very vulnerable children. So some high-risk groups for COVID-19 have been identified, especially elder people or those who are in nursing homes. But there has been really very little public attention or policy initiatives uh, focused on children. And I, as a medical sociologist who specializes in pediatrics, I have to ask the question of why is this the case? Oh, all right. it, if we look at incidents and prevalence, I think we have a data problem. And um, I really appreciate the uh, uh, Dr. Gar's presentation saying that there's not really as much data around on children as we would benefit from in order to develop the right kinds of strategies. And it could be that children are not at as high a risk of getting COVID-19. I think the data would indicate that that is true, but it could also be that we're not collecting data on those children. Um, and as we see that they haven't had enough tests even for the um, healthcare practitioners, much less for um, children. The World Health Organization reminds us that everybody who is at risk can be uh, subject to a higher rate of COVID. Um, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta have documented cases of children who have gotten it. Um, and as you see uh, with the MISC, uh, and there are a variety of new disorders that are associated with the COVID-19 in children. I think that we're still learning a lot about this very sneaky uh, virus and we are not familiar with it. And so it's possible that we are just uh, at the breaking point of seeing what could be long-term implications of the disease for children. And we know that some children have indeed died from it. So it's not that uh, children aren't at risk of COVID-19, they are. If we look at housing, um, housing is a protective uh, factor. Uh, for children in general um, and children who are subject to housing distress in particular. If we think about housing, we can go into our home, we can control the heat or the coolness, uh, we have a refrigerator, we can go get some ice, we could have a stove and make chicken soup, uh, we have a bed that we can lay in, we have the ability to have a washer and dryer, to have clean sheets if we have fevered on them. Uh, we have the ability to go uh, to a clean restroom um, or to take a bath or a shower. We can sleep in beds that are ours and we can um, lay on the couch perhaps and watch television. Um, and we can have the ability to get past a disease uh, in a much faster rate if we have a house. But if we don't, um, housing distress causes all kinds of uh, risk factors for children. If you live with other people, uh, we have little control on who comes and who goes, who people are bringing in and what they have done within their own lifestyle. Uh, maybe they wear a mask, maybe they don't. Maybe they're associating with people who are infected. Um, we may not know unless they tell us the truth. If we live with others, we know that people uh, 
may be in shared living environments. And so uh, the sleep schedules may be off, your showering schedule, your ability to eat. Um, all of these things become disrupted when you do not have your own place to stay. Um, and you certainly um, are exposed to more ailments um, and potentialities as a result. Um, if you are homeless, uh, there's a variety of types of homeless. All right, you can live in a shelter. You could be doubled up living with other people trying to make ends meet. You could be living in a campground. You could be living on the street. Uh, there are all different kinds of ways that you can be homeless. So it's not a one size fits all. Uh, but we do know that there's, especially for children, little control that they have over their um, physical environment or who comes into it. If you are living in shelters or residential facilities in general, um, you are in congregate living situations. There are many people um, shoved together. Usually these are because of cost factors. Um, we even see this um, in college dormitories. Uh, we're worried about opening them up because people are too close together. When you are living in close proximity with one another, when you are sharing the same bathrooms, uh, the same water, the same uh, cooking facilities, uh, same doorknobs, uh, we end up having uh, the inability to social distance. All right. Um, if we are looking at children who are in detainment centers or jail, they are also in high risk um, housing situations, as are the children at the border um, who are the refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants coming um, to be safe um, in their new environment and then being met with all kinds of new challenges. If we look at the trajectory of child illnesses in general, um, we know that identifying the illness is the first thing. I, it, I mean, ideally preventing the illness, but if you have been exposed to something, when do we identify that someone is really sick or not? We have seen the past two speakers talk about the different types of symptoms that children may have. Um, and having a low grade fever, having a cold, having a uh, runny nose, having a cough, uh, having a bellyache. These are not unusual symptoms for children to have in general. Um, and so when do you decide that this is a serious illness and when is it going to resolve on its own, given a little bit of time, okay, and a little bit of care? So parents who are homeless uh, who are dealing with where they're going to live tonight, how are they going to feed their kids, how are they going to uh, keep, as they say, the wolf away from the door. Uh, when you're talking about creditors, we're talking about all kinds of ways that people are at risk when they are homeless and in housing distress. Um, identifying it may be hard. Uh, it's easy for us to sometimes miss symptoms, and especially if children are young and they are not verbal um, or we don't have the thermometers uh, to be able to identify when someone is really sick. Then we have to decide when to seek professional care. When can we take care of it ourselves? When can we go to the pharmacy and get over-the-counter drugs uh, for it? When do we do self-care, uh, folk remedies? And when is it that we go to the doctor or to the emergency room? Um, we know that getting an appointment can be very difficult for people on a good day, and we're certainly not in good days now, are we, um, with the COVID. And so uh, if you can get an appointment, this would be the first thing. But many doctors are not taking new patients. Uh, they may be doing phone therapies with people because they too don't want to be exposed. They're encouraging people not to go to the uh, emergency room unless you are very sick. So uh, getting an appointment could be a challenge. Um, the logistics of getting to the appointment. Um, if you are doing teletherapy, then it requires that you have a smartphone or a computer with Wi-Fi access. Um, if you are physically going to the appointment, it may mean walking a considerable period of time. And if you're sick, uh, especially if you're a child, it could be a very long walk 
uh, we're talking about the difficulties of mass transportation, of getting on buses or subways or trains to get to an appointment. Uh, so there, there's all kinds of difficulties even getting the appointment. And then once you get it, can you afford it? Many people in the US do not have health care. And we are finding that under the current administration, they are talking about uh, doing away with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, people have been losing um, health insurance as they have been losing their jobs. And so being able to have health insurance in general becomes problematic. And then can you afford the co-pays that go along with it or the uh, medicines that the doctor may require or the tests? Right. And speaking of getting a test, we know that um, COVID tests are not generally used on children, um, that they have been hard enough for adults um, in high-risk occupations to get much less uh, children. And I think this goes back to a data problem where if we're not testing, we don't know. Um, and so then we can think that they don't exist. If children do get hospitalized and uh, they get removed from their parents, this is another very difficult situation. Um, some die, and then we know that some are sent home. And then can you recover? Do you have a bed you can rest in? Do you have a place where you can stay? In many communities uh, near where I live, people who are homeless are given tents uh, to live in and sleeping bags and said that that's where they should quarantine um, before and if they do get sick. And that way they won't be exposed to anyone else. And at least then they may have some degree of control over their environment. The conclusion then is that economic and housing conditions directly influence whether children are going to be identified as sick and get the care that they need. And at every point of intervention, poverty and housing distress interfere with the prevention, identification, treatment, and recovery of illness in children. If we look at the care priorities that we as a system use, our priorities are determined a lot by data. And again, if children aren't being um, diagnosed, uh, then we can think that they don't exist. Um, the uh, CDC report, um, that came out in April indicates that many, as many as 80% of children may be exposed to the virus, uh, but they are asymptomatic. Um, and so if they don't have symptoms, then it's easy to say they're not sick, they don't have it. Um, we know that there's no vaccine available for anyone and certainly none that have been tested for children in particular, and that may be an entirely different um, situation. Um, for social distancing uh, in housing distressed situations, it's very problematic. Uh, people are sharing, sleeping, walking, bathing, cooking, um, transportation situations. When we look at the morbidity and mortality rates, um, often people do get sick, they do die. Uh, are their rates being attributed to COVID or not? Um, we do know that the estimates are uh, that probably whatever numbers we have are low compared to what is actually occurring related to the disease. Um, the, and again, we go back to that perception that children aren't going to get it, or if they do, they're not going to be very sick. Uh, maybe this is comforting to us, but I don't think we should automatically assume that this is the case. We know that with COVID and housing distress, um, it it creates a variety of prevention problems. It's very difficult to prevent um, the way that a housed person and someone with resource may have. Okay. There is high comorbidity between poverty, housing distress, and illness in general, and I would assume COVID in particular. Um, there's high unemployment um, going around the US and around the world where people are getting sick uh, their jobs are disappearing, the economy may be slow to recover, which means that the economic problems are not short-term, they are long-term. We can anticipate bankruptcies, evictions, um, and loss of ability to be able to protect oneself going up. Um, conservative estimates are to see a 45% escalation of homelessness um, and the reports indicate that in the U.S. Uh, they have 
predicted 800,000 people will be homeless by the end of summer 2020. And I would concur that that is a low estimate. Uh, I just published a book with Rutledge on changing the paradigm of homelessness. And we looked at how um, homelessness was being defined and how it was being measured and that whatever numbers that they are using are actually very uh, low compared to the numbers that are really existing and especially for children because children again are not counted in general in homeless uh, context. We can see the rise of hunger uh, occurring, uh, the lack of health care in general, all due to the difficulties of the economy um, and the secondary dangers of COVID. Right. Um, if you have fewer resource dollars and you don't have health insurance and you don't have a home, what are you going to do when your little child is sick? All right. And there's a difference between having a baby and being 10 years old and being 17 years old. All right. And often there are fewer resources uh, for these children who are 17 and 18 because they fall through the cracks. They're not necessarily cared for by their parents, but they are also uh, not enabled to be seen as over 18 and qualify for resources. The schools have had to close for understandable reasons. Uh, the health care, uh, the food, the school nurse, the social support, the resources, the place to go, uh, the structure, uh, the ability to succeed. Again, a secondary form of compromising that makes things difficult. Moving on to looking at COVID and the border children in uh, the US-Mexico border, we know that uh, the children who are coming to the border originally have traveled a long way and that they may be very sick, tired, uh, weak, they've not eaten well, their ability to be clean, to sleep well, all have been compromised on their journey. Um, Border children in general seem to have higher rates of respiratory illnesses in general. Um, they probably have not been immunized, and if they were immunized in their home countries, they're not carrying their immunization documentation on the journey, or if they do, it has gotten lost along the way. Um, historically, if children are going to stay in the US, they are given vaccines and health care, um, but if we look at the current administration deporting children and deporting families. Uh, many of them may not have um, any health care at all. They're sent along. Um, decisions were made not to immunize border children uh, for the flu, um, despite some deaths and very serious health conditions of children um, who have been locked in cages or in, detained in these uh, congregate living situations where um, social distancing is virtually impossible. If we look at other kinds of housing programs, uh, we know that it's very difficult for children um, to have the kind of prevention, um, care and treatment that they need. Um, if you look at the children who are in jail, who are in juvenile detention facilities, who are in residential programs for a variety of reasons, it could be for drug or alcohol use, it could be because they have mental illness, uh, could be that they have behavior challenges that they can't be managed by parents at home. Could be that they have cognitive difficulties. Anytime kids are put into a residential program, um, it puts them at risk of not being able to social distance and have the same kind of care that they would have if they were housed. Um, so the COVID pandemic has exposed another problem for us, um, not just the disease, but the care of children in general and the care of um, homeless and housing distressed children in particular. All right. And it, this was not of their making, uh, but they are the uh, victims of it. All right. um, so we know that the United States is the only member country of the United Nations who has not ratified the world's most um, endorsed human rights treaty in the history of the world, and that's the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, out of the 193 countries, the US is the only one who has not done that. 
And so um, looking at the lack of human rights for children, um, we have to look at that front and center. If we look at the uh, UNCRC's or Convention on the Rights of the Child articles, um, they have many that directly pertain to COVID and to health care of housing distressed um, children. Um, if you go to them, uh, you can see that uh, Article 2 talks about the right from discrimination on the basis of parent status. Um, if their parents are homeless or if they are refugees um, uh, or illegal aliens at the border, um, children end up being discriminated upon and not given care on the basis of that. Uh, we know that Article 3 states that the best interest of the child should always be the primary consideration of decisions by politicians, by organizations, uh, by parents, um, and often that does not happen. If we look at you know, Article 6, states must ensure children's survival and their maximum development. Um, the CRC understands that the future of the world really depends upon the well-being of children. And so it is uh, encouraged that they have uh, support for their maximum development. Article 9, do not separate children from their parents against their will, um, which is certainly happening at the border. Article 12, children have the right to have a voice and participate in decisions that impact them, um, whether that is on housing um, or others. Um, we're seeing like in Article um, 20, if you move children uh, from their families, they are the state is required to give them special protection, um, and especially if they are refugees and asylum seekers. Articles 9 and 24 are looking at children's rights to have access to preventing mental and physical illnesses and to have the access to the highest standards of health care prevention, treatment, and recovery. Um, and to not get into what is regarded as medical negligence. Article 27 is what we will leave with uh, because we are looking at how the states are obligated, according to the CRC, to make sure that children have access to decent nutrition, clothing, housing, as well as uh, physical, uh, mental, spiritual, and moral care. All right, so if the CRC was implemented, we would find that there'd be a different conversation going on about the health care of children. Um, it is obvious that young lives matter too, and we have to have a uh, question why there's not greater outcry on uh, children's access to health, uh, to education, and to all of the support services. Uh, that other groups uh, seem to be more entitled to. Um, I would encourage you to join the millions who are in support of human rights in general and children's human rights um, in particular. Um, if my mentor pediatrician, Ray Helfer, uh, indicated that if we did today, what we know as pediatricians, we need to have for children to grow well. It would be a very different world that we're living in right now. So if we look at um, this question of when, um, what, what more do we need to do? It is within our reach to be able to do this, right? So I think that uh, we in the pediatric community really need to be the voice of children. Um, I have two articles on housing and COVID issues. Uh, one is at Medium and one is at Context. Um, so perhaps you would like to take a look at those uh, because these elaborate on my conversation with you today. I would be very happy to work with you, support your work, um, and there's my email at yvisting at salemstate.edu. And I thank um, Yoshika and everyone for uh, participating in this event. Thank you.